Romans chapter 13. I'll give you a, a quick reminder of kind of where we've been in Romans since uh, last October. The, Paul is writing to a group of believers in Rome, and he is addressing the fact that they have decided to kind of start adopting some Jewish practices. These are either Jewish believers or uh, Gentile believers who are starting to adopt some Jewish practices themselves. And Paul is reminding them that it doesn't matter, that there is no favoritism with God. It doesn't matter if you're from a Jewish background or a Gentile background, that Jews and Gentiles are both sinners before God. In the end of chapter 2, he talks about how the Jews, or actually at the beginning of chapter 3, Paul says that the Jews have an advantage over the Gentiles. And Paul says very clearly that the advantage the Jews had is that to them came the prophets, to them came the law and the testimonies. Jesus was born as a Jew, and so that was the advantage that the Jews had. But then Paul very quickly asked the question, are Jews better off than Gentiles? And he says, no, absolutely not. Jews and Gentiles are like, are under sin. Jews and Gentiles alike are separated from God. And that it is through faith and not through works of the law that righteousness is uh, given to a person. That it, It's not by the works of the Jewish law. It's not by tradition or custom that we are made righteous with God. It is through faith in the completed work of Christ that whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you are redeemed. In chapter 4, Paul reminds the Jews, or at least the Gentiles who are acting like Jews, he reminds them that even Abraham was called righteous by God before there was a law and before Abraham was circumcised. He says that, that Abraham's righteousness came through faith. And Romans 4 concludes with, this was written not only for Abraham's sake, but for all of us who would put our faith in Christ. That righteousness depends upon faith. Chapter 5, Paul talks about how Adam, through Adam, sin entered the world, and therefore all people, Jews and Gentiles, became sinners. And in the same way, Christ entered the world and made righteousness available for Jews and Gentiles alike. Chapter 6 is all about the cross, about what it means to be in Christ. And Paul addresses sin, and he talks about how those who are in Christ have been set free from captivity to sin. They've been set free from the power of sin. They've been raised to walk in newness of life. That sin is no longer master over them. That sin no longer has authority over them. And then in chapter 7, Paul is going to talk about what it looks like to live according to the law, the futility of the law, and how the law cannot ever make anyone righteous. At the conclusion of chapter 7, Paul is going to ask the question again, who can set us free from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Chapter 8, Paul is going to talk about living according to the Holy Spirit, how we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to live a life that pleases God, how we have been called children of God, how we are children of righteousness now, children of the Spirit and not children of flesh. And then chapters 9, 10, and 11, Paul is going to talk about how the Jews have rejected Christ and how Christ has been offered now to the Gentiles so that the Gentiles also would believe. That's chapters 10, 11, and uh, sorry, 9, 10, and 11. Chapter 12, Paul's going to talk about the unity of the church. And then in chapter 13, he's going to talk about submitting to the governing authorities, this unjust Roman government that the Christians are under. And that brings us up to speed. That is a really fast kind of synopsis. I mean, I guess that's what a synopsis is supposed to be, right? A summary kind of statement. So that's a synopsis of Romans. Now pick up with me in 13.8, 13.8, where Paul says this, Owe nothing to anyone except that you love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in the saying, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Do this knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is almost gone, the day is near. Therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity, not in sensuality, not in strife, not in jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts or its desires. This is a lot. There is a lot that is said in these last few verses. We've got seven verses 
And there's so much information packed into it, but it really kind of breaks down into two really natural divisions for us. The first being 8 through 10, and the next being 11 through 14. So let's tackle them that way. 8 through 10, own nothing to anyone except that you love one another. Now, this is coming out of what he's just said in chapter 13, 6, and 7. For because of this, you also pay taxes for rulers or servants of God, devoting themselves to the very th- this very thing. Render to everyone what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom is due, fear to whom fear is due, honor to whom honor is due. Owe nothing to anyone except that you love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. So give what is, give what is due to the governing authorities. Give taxes or fear or respect. Give what's due them. Don't owe anyone anything except that you love each other for in this is the fulfillment of the law. Now that's an interesting thing for Paul to say, that to love one another is fulfillment of the law. And and the reason it's interesting is because up to this point, Paul has made it abundantly clear that salvation is not through the law. It's through faith. It's through uh, the the faith that we exhibit in Jesus Christ and and his death and his resurrection. It's it's through faith that we're deemed righteous. And so why then is he saying to people, by the way, who are trying to live according to the law. Why is he saying to them, if you love each other, this is the fulfillment of the law? Well, this isn't the only place that Paul says this. We'll go look at another place in just a minute in Galatians. But I want you to kind of keep this in mind. Here's what's happening, okay? So Paul is addressing a group of people who have put faith in Jesus, but have decided somewhere along the way that the way they they maintain their faith is by doing the works of the law. We're going to see that in this parallel text, almost the exact same language over in Galatians 5. And that's what Paul's addressing in Galatians 5 as well. A group of believers who have put their faith in God and somewhere along the way switched back and said, okay, my faith is in God, but now I'm going to do do the works of the law to maintain my faith. And so Paul is addressing that not only to the Roman church, but to the churches in Galatia. And then we'll find that James also addresses the exact same issue. And so what is going on is that Paul is speaking to people who have a real love for the law. They've started to value the law as higher than uh, the things of Christ. And, And they're putting a lot of emphasis on the law and, hey, we need to observe the Jewish law and we need to observe the Jewish customs. And what Paul is saying to them is almost kind of like sarcastically, like here you are thinking about all these laws that you need to do. He goes, look, if you will love each other, the law is fulfilled. Anything that says do not murder, do not commit adultery, if if you love each other, you're not doing those things, right? You're not murdering them. You're not committing adultery. You're you're not treating each other wickedly. He goes, just love each other. So he's trying to switch the mindset of these people who are putting their confidence in the law. He's trying to switch their mindset to a mindset of love. That it's not that I owe you some measure of the law or some measure of obedience to some Jewish command that's long since passed. Paul is saying what you owe each other is that you love each other. So he's just said, obey the the government, submit to the governing authorities, pay taxes to whom taxes are due, respect to whom respect is due, fear to whom fear is due, and then love each other. This is a commandment that's a little bit more internal. Love one another. In fact, in John chapter 13, 34 and 35, Jesus says this, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples, that you have love one for another. I've said this before in other places and and, uh, people don't tend to like it, but I feel like we're an okay group here. We'll, We'll deal with it. And if we don't like it tonight, we'll deal with it in small groups this week, right? But a lot of people will say stuff like, The way we treat the lost, the way we treat people who don't know Jesus is the sign that we're followers of Christ. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. But what the Bible does say over and over again is the way we treat each other indicates that we're followers of Christ. You and I are part of the same family. You and I have been redeemed and rescued and ransomed by Christ. And you and I share in common the empty tomb and the faith in Jesus who sits on his throne. And we long for his return. You and I are family. You and I have been adopted into the same faith through Jesus Christ. In fact, 1 John, you're going to count it differently than I do, and so don't take this as a hard and fast rule, but I count about 33 things in the five chapters of 1 John where he says, this is how you can know you're a believer. This is how you can know you're a believer. This is what a believer behaves like. And out of the 33, 11 of them are loving the brethren, loving those who proclaim faith in Jesus. 
This is how the world knows that we're followers of Christ, based on how we treat one another, our care for one another. And that's what Paul's addressing. He's going, you're so concerned about the law, be concerned about loving each other. Care for one another. Let me show you uh, where Paul says it to the churches in Galatia. Flip over, if you would, to Galatians chapter 5. Actually, Galatians 3, just as an introduction to the context of the book. (laughs) And I really want to say now, actually, Galatians 1, but... (sighs) Anyway, Genesis, yeah. We're starting Genesis in January. So, yeah, we're starting all over. Galatians 3, beginning in verse 1. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? I I just want to say really quickly that preachers can't get away with this anymore. Pastors very seldom can get up and say to their congregation, you guys are fools. Um, They don't keep their jobs very long. Paul just didn't care. He's just writing letters all over the world saying, you guys are idiots, you know? And so uh, here he says this, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So here's the question he poses to the Galatian churches. Did you receive the power of the Holy Spirit by doing the works of the law Or did you receive the power of the Holy Spirit through faith? The answer is obvious. It's through faith. It's what Paul addresses in Galatia. It's what Paul addresses in Rome. It's through faith. Verse 3. Are you really so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, he's answering the question from verse 2. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and work miracles among you Do so by the law or by faith. So he asked this question. You foolish Galatians, having started this journey of faith through the work of the Holy Spirit, do you really believe that now it's through the works of the law? He goes, don't you know that the miracles and the power of God that you've seen demonstrated in your life never came through observing the law, always came through faith. The power of God in your life, he said, didn't come through works of the law. It came through faith. Bear with me here. Go over to Galatians chapter 5. 5, 5.1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, do not, uh, therefore, stand firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Let me just give you the context very quickly. The freedom that he's talking about here is freedom from the law. It is for freedom from the law that Christ has set you free. Therefore, do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Do not be subject again to the Jewish law for righteousness. Verse 2, behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Jewish law, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under the obligation to keep the entire law. You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace, for we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but only faith working through what? Love. For you are running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from God who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough, leavens yeast. I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you will bear judgment whoever he is. But I, brethren, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. I wish that those who are troubling you would mutilate themselves or emasculate themselves or cut it all off. He's very graphic here. Verse 13. For you were called to freedom, i.e. from the law. Only do not turn your freedom in an oppor- into an opportunity for your flesh. But through love serve one another. For the entire law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Verse 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So Paul's saying this. He's going, look, Galatians, he goes, 
You've put your faith in Jesus. You, you, you've put your faith and your confidence in the miraculous power of God as evidence through the faith that you have in him. And now by some misunderstanding, you're turning to works for righteousness? He goes, that's stupid. That's foolish that you would do such a thing. And he says, who fooled you? Who tricked you? And he says, Christ came to set you free from the law so that you would live for him. And he goes, and those who are trying to deceive you into observing the law again for righteousness, let them be cut off. Because if you seek to observe any part of the law, you have to observe all of the law for righteousness sake. And he goes, here's what you should do. You should love one another. You're so worried about fulfilling the law, love each other. And the whole law is fulfilled. And then he says, but I'm going to say to you this. Walk by the Spirit and you won't carry out the desires of the flesh. It's interesting because in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks, again, Paul, talking to the Corinthian church, talks about the spiritual gifts that the different people in the body of Christ have. And he's talking about all these great gifts that they have, but he concludes there's arrogance. There were people in 1 Corinthians, uh, not in 1 Corinthians, that's not the name of their city. There were people in Corinth who were boasting in the gifts that they had. Oh, my gift's better than yours. Oh, man, your gift's better than mine. I'm lower than you are. And there was this kind of hierarchy among the gifts. And 1 Corinthians 12 concludes with Paul saying, let me show you a more excellent way. And then 1 Corinthians 13 is what we typically call the love chapter. Most people read it in their weddings. I think Michelle and I had it read in our wedding. I don't know if we were getting married today that I would have it read in our wedding because it's primarily dealing with how to handle your spiritual gift. And Paul starts off by saying, look, if you can understand all mysteries, if you can speak in the tongues of men and angels, if you submit your body to be burned and you give all, of you, all that you have to the poor, but you do it without love. In other words, if you have all these great spiritual gifts, but you have no love, he said, it profits you nothing, it's worthless, and you're just a noisy gong or clanging symbol. He says all these great spiritual gifts without love amount to nothing. And so Paul is talking not just to the Roman church, not just to the Galatians churches, but to the Corinthian church about the importance of the the brethren loving each other. Oh, no one, any debt, Paul says, save that you love them. Go over to James chapter 2, if you would, please. I think most of the time, I'm not saying that we don't get it right sometimes, but I would say that most of the time, uh, unless we just grew up in a really stupendous, tremendous kind of family, most of the time we we grow up with some version of conditional love, um, of earning love, of people being pleased with us based on our behavior or our conduct. And, and we t- kind of give love in that same regard. We, we love people more who uh, seem to be genuine towards us and we find it more difficult to love people that have been hostile towards us in the past. And most of the time we view loving people through the lens of our culture and our experience rather than through the lens of the cross. that that God loves people and would have them redeemed and would have them know him. And so more often than not, we we love people based on our experience with them rather than God's view of them. And and that's kind of something that I am actively trying to correct in my life. And in the book of James, there are some rich believers in the church who do not care for the poor believers in the church. And the rich believers in the church kind of give preferential treatment to, to uh, the rich and, and defer against the poor. Pick up with me in James chapter 2, verse 1. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring uh, and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my footstool, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? So here's what he's saying. 
He's saying that people are coming into the gathering and the really nice looking people, the really dressed, uh, the, the people who are dressed well, smell nice, look good, they're like, oh, hey, take this preferential seat, take this good seat. And then the other people who are, you know, like not so clean and not so nice and not so rich, hey, sit over there or stand over there, or sit at my feet. This isn't just a first century problem. If you're familiar with George Mueller, born in 1805, died in 1898 in Bristol, England, he pastored a small church, built five orphanages, housed over 10,000 kids in the course of his ministry. He pastored a small church, and for many years, the tradition of the church was that, that people were given their seats closer to the pulpit for, for the more money that they gave. And so you would get, the, the closer you were, it was evidence that you had given more money to the church. And so they would set people in order of who gave the most. And it was just kind of this visual representation. And finally, George had enough of it, and he put a box in the back with a hole in it and a lock on it and said, put your offerings in there. And no one ever then knew, I mean, it's not like, you know, writing checks or anything, it was just cash, money, and so no one then ever knew who the money came from, and so that he did away with that. He was like, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna show preferential treatment to somebody just because they gave more money. And uh, the downside was that the deacons who were supposed to count the money and then give it to George and his family often forgot. And so there'd be months that would go by without him ever getting paid because uh, he was too timid to tell them, hey, you guys need to give me my money. But anyway... Uh, he, he was so sick of the preferential treatment, and so he did away with it. So here's this preferential treatment from the rich against the poor. Look at verse 5, James 2, 5. Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world, think spiritually poor, did not God choose the spiritual poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. It is not the rich who oppress you in person. Is it not the rich who, who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you're really fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Forever keeps the whole law, yet breaks one part of it, has become guilty of all. For the one who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. If you commit adultery but do not murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For, the, for judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy, and mercy triumphs over judgment. So he says here again, love one another. Loving each other is the fulfillment of the law. Uh, again, you and I, go back to Romans 13 now, you and I are not under the law. We're not Jews. We don't believe that the law is the basis for righteousness. We believe that faith is the basis for righteousness. But in each of these cases, they are talking to people who still have a worldview, whether in Rome or the regions of Galatia or James's letter. They each, he's, they're talking to an audience that each have a worldview that, thank you, I've put my faith in Jesus, but now I'm going to maintain my righteousness through works. And in each case, they're failing at something that's very key. They're failing at loving one another. They're not showing each other the love of Christ. This is going to get really important next week when we uh, talk through Romans chapter 14, and we'll reference this a lot about what it means to, to love one another. But again, here Paul, Romans 13, 8 through following, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For, for the command, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that comes from Leviticus 19. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Verse 11. Do this knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awake from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. I love this statement. Um, because it never is, is, it's never false. If I were to say to you, salvation, the return of Christ, is nearer to us now than when we first believed. And then if I say it again in five minutes, it's still true. Uh, with every moment that passes, we are nearer the return of our Lord than we were when we first believed. And, and Paul says this, there was very much in the first century church this idea that Christ was coming soon. And we shouldn't fault them for that. We are called as believers to have the expectation that Christ is coming soon. That's how we live our lives. If we, if we begin to think uh, like 
Christ talks about in the parables in the Gospels, if we begin to think our master's far away, it's going to be a long time until he comes, the conclusion of those parables is that people who took that point of view lived wanton lives full of, of wicked pleasures. But those who had the view that my master is coming back, Jesus is coming back any moment, they, they bring their life into obedience to God. They live their lives for the glory of God and, and for the purpose of God. So Paul says this, he says, knowing this, be aware of the time, know the time that our salvation is nearer now than it's ever been. The night is almost gone, the day is near, therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as, in, as we live in the light, as we're in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity, not in sensuality, not in strife, not in jealousy. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust or its cares. Be aware of the time. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, 10 through 15 says it this way. It says that the first heavens and earth were destroyed by a flood, speaking of Noah's day. And it said that these present heavens and earth are being reserved for a fiery judgment, uh, which God will consume all the elements of the earth and he will make a new heavens and a new earth. And he says, because we know that this is the way the earth will come to an end, we should conduct ourselves in fear, holy reverence in our stay upon this earth. Because we know that Christ is returning, because we know that he comes with judgment, because we know he comes with power, and because our attitude is he's coming soon, the night is almost over, the day is almost upon us, because those things resonate in our heart, it should quicken our behavior into obedience to Christ. Not obedience to the law, not the sake of Jewish custom, but to Jesus, the exaltation of Christ, that we would clothe ourselves in Christ, that we would put on Christ and give no provision to our flesh, to our human ability. Paul's already talked about in chapter 6 that our flesh has been done away with, that we've been made to walk in newness of life, that, that sin has been rendered inoperable. And he's already talked in chapter 8 how the Holy Spirit has come and that we are no longer of the flesh, but we are in fact of the Spirit if we belong to Christ. So now he's reminding them, because you know the day is drawing near, Put your mind on that. Fix your attention on the truth that Christ is soon in coming and let that bring you into obedience, into submission to Jesus. That you would put on Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Why? Because in chapter 8, uh, you are not of the flesh. That's not who you are anymore. You're in the Spirit. If you have named the name of Jesus as God, as King, as Lord, you are not a person of flesh any longer. You are not made righteous through works of the flesh. You have been redeemed and rescued and ransomed through the Holy Spirit. We are spiritual people now, not fleshly people. Let me show you something else. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul's addressing it in 1 Thessalonians 4. The Thessalonians are worried uh, that maybe the resurrection has already happened, that they've missed it. This is uh, a common theme in the first century. And, um, well, the resurrection is a common theme. In the Corinthian church, they believed that there was no resurrection. Paul rebukes them for that. The Thessalonian church is fearful that they've missed the resurrection. And then pick up with me in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1. Now as to the times and the seasons, brethren, speaking of the return of Christ, you have no need for anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child and they will not escape. Now listen, we get this wrong a lot because he's just said in verse two, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. There are a couple of things that we should know. The Bible's already said, Jesus has already said in the gospels that no man knows the day or the hour. Anytime you hear somebody say, Jesus is coming back on this day, they're wrong, okay? Uh, there was a book that came out when I was um, 13 years old, 88 Reasons Jesus is Coming Back in 88. And when Jesus didn't come back in 88, the guy said he messed up, and so he put out the follow-up book the next year, 89 Reasons He's Coming Back in 89. Uh, we know, of course, that he was supposed to come back in 2005, and then he was going to come in 2012, and, you know, like everybody seems to know, right? And they're always wrong, and they're always... Um, <laughs> I don't know, any Parks and Rec fans in here? 
Do you remember the episode where Zorg or whatever the people are, they worship the lizard king, right? And the guy's like, oh man, he didn't come back. He goes, but I, I re-examined the text and he's coming back May 21st or whatever it is. Can we, can we have the park May 21st? And she goes, oh, I'm sorry, we've got an ice cream social. And he does this to the book, sorry, May 22nd. <laughs> and she's like, she's like, yeah, 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 that'll be fine. Okay, you can have the park May 22nd. And he goes, yeah, yeah, that must be when he's coming back. And so people are doing that all the time with Jesus, right? Oh, it was this time. No, 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 I was wrong. I miscalculated. It's actually this time. Uh, listen, forget all of that and have the attitude that the day is almost here. Have that as your attitude. Have the expectation be that Christ is coming back. We know that with full confidence. I was able to preach at a, as, at a, as a guest at a church this morning, and I said, the only promises of the scripture, uh, the only promises of God that have not yet been fulfilled are the promises pertaining to the return of Christ. And because every other promise God has made has happened exactly as he said it would, the return of Christ will happen according to the word of God, just as he declared it would, and our attitude should be any moment Christ breaks through the clouds saying glory, right? At the sound of the trumpet with the voice of the archangel, Christ returns. Now, here's what people say. We don't know when that's going to be. True. We don't know when that's going to be. But then people say, but it's going to take us like a thief in the night. Catch this. The thief in the night part isn't about believers. It's about non-believers, we don't know when the day is going to be, but hear me say this, we will not be surprised when it happens. The non-believers will be surprised when it happens. The believers will not. Those who are longing for the return of Christ when they see him in the sky will not be caught off guard. Let's read this again. Look at verse 2. For you yourselves full, uh, know full well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While they are saying, they, the other people, peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like a woman in labor pains uh, with a child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in the darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief, for you are sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since, since we are of the day, let us be sober-minded, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether, so, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. You are, brethren, not of the darkness. That the thief would overtake the, the not, huh, that the day would overtake you like a thief, for you are sons of light, and sons of the day, not of the night nor of the darkness. Wake up, be sober-minded, be alert. Isn't that what Paul's saying to the to the Christians in Rome? Go back, Christians in, in Romans thirteen. Look at what he's saying. Knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day is all already near. Therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light and behave properly, clothing ourselves with Jesus Christ. The conduct, I don't know how to say this any better than this, the conduct of the Christian who does not actively anticipate the return of Christ differs wildly from the conduct of the Christian who thinks of nothing but the return of Christ, who longs for the return of Christ, who aches for the return of Christ. Does that make sense? When we ache and long for the return of Christ, our attitude is the dawn is almost here. The night is almost past. Wake up, be alert, be sober-minded, clothe yourself in Christ. Let your conduct be honoring to Jesus because he's about to break through the sky. This is what Paul's saying. It's, it's these few verses, right? Just a couple of verses here, just a couple of verses in Thessalonians, but incredibly powerful uh, ideas and texts that we need to take hold of. The night is drawing to a close. Since you know that Christ is coming, since you know these things, since you know that your salvation is nearer now than it used to be, wake up. 
Be alert. Be ready. Be vigilant. Clothe yourself with Jesus. I believe with all my heart that there are a lot of things that Paul says to a specific church. I, I, don't, I don't think, I think there's application we can draw from it, but for example, uh, Paul saying in 1 Corinthians 5 that a man and his father are sleeping with the same woman. I, I hope that that's probably never a text that I have to preach from directly to deal with an issue here, right? Um, that would be problematic. But there's still application from that text. This is one of those texts, though, here in Romans 13, that I feel Paul could stand right here on this stage and say to us, hey, be alert, knowing the night is almost over, that the day is almost here, that your salvation is nearer than when you first believed. Clothe yourself with Christ. This is, this is who we are. Our hope, our longing is for the return of Jesus. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16 says, Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober in your spirit, set your hope fully, fully on the grace that will be brought to you on the day Christ Jesus is revealed. All of my hope, all of my confidence is set on that. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, If there is no resurrection from the dead, if this is all we get, we are of all men most to be pitied. Our longing, our hope, our confidence is set on the day that Jesus breaks through the sky and brings all of this story, this, this redemptive story, this redemptive narrative to a com conclusion that we're made to be like him. 1 Corinthians 15, 49, speaking of the resurrection of the body, says, just as we have borne the image of earthly Adam, so shall we also bear the image of Jesus. We're going to be transformed into his likeness, but we don't know what that even means yet. 1 John 3, 1 and 2 says, how great a love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The world uh, does not know us because it did not know him. Dear children, we do not yet know what we will be, but we know that when he appears, we will be made like him, for we will see him as he truly is. That is our hope. That is our confidence. And our salvation right now, in this moment, is nearer than the day we first believed. Wake up. Be alert. Be sober-minded. And put your confidence on Christ clothing yourself with him, that you might live according to him. Not according to the law, not according to righteousness through the law, but according to Christ. Here's a couple of things I want us to pray about tonight as we close. Tonight we're going to pray, uh, and I, um, we're going to pray and we're going to ask that, that God would give us his kind of love for the brethren. Not, not love that's based on our circumstances or our conditions or how we feel today, but the, but the kind of love that God has for our brethren, that God would give us that kind of love for one another. But we're gonna pray that God would set our minds rightly on his return, that it would be very much present in our thinking, not just on Sundays, not, not just on Easter Sunday, but that it would be very present in our thinking day in and day out. And then we're gonna pray that that God would give us wisdom as to what it means to be fully clothed in Christ, to put on Christ so that we could live according to his truth instead of according to the law, that we would live according to Jesus. Those are the three things we're gonna pray. And here's the way we're gonna do this, like we've done it the last few weeks. I'm just gonna introduce the topic and you can pray with your spouse or your friends near you, you can pray by yourself and I'll just give you a little bit to pray and then I'll, I'll pray and then we'll move on to the next one. But if you would now, just take a moment and would you just ask that God would give you a love for his people like he loves them. Just spend a moment in prayer asking God to give you love for people like he loves them. God, what a great, abundant, overwhelming, measureless love you have poured out on us. Not because we were righteous in your sight, not because we have earned it in any way, but because of your grace, because of your affection, because of the love with which you loved us. For God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only begotten son. We know that, Lord God. We trust that. God, give us Give us the kind of love for the church that you have for the church. Give us a deep and abiding, <coughs> abiding love for the brethren. 
Let the world know that we are your disciples by our love for one another, our care for one another, the way that we serve one another and pray for one another and minister to one another. Let the world be attracted to us because of that. And no, that's wrong. Lord, let the world be attracted to you because of that, because of the, the care with which we lavish on each other, that we would love each other with the genuine love of Christ. Take a moment now, and if you would, please pray and ask that God would set your mind on his return, that you would focus on the day that Jesus Christ will break through the sky. Lord God, what a great confidence we have in the return of Jesus that the work you started in redemption through Christ, through the cross, through the empty tomb, through the ascension is not yet finished. But there will be a day that Christ breaks through the sky with the sound of the trumpet, the voice of the archangel, with the host of heaven at his hills. And this world will be made new. And sun and moon and stars will be done away with and the glory of God will illumine all of it, Lord. And we will stand before you and we will cry out, worthy, worthy is the lamb. And God, we will stand before your throne. We'll be made new ourselves. God, that is our full hope, our full confidence, our full joy. Let it be forever in our minds. Let it be at the forefront of our minds. Let us think constantly on who you are, your return, your love for us. The fact that this world is not our home, that this isn't the end for us that one day we will close our eyes in death and we will open them in your presence or you will come back. And either way, we'll see you face to face. Let that give us great joy, great comfort, great peace. May our lives be lived by that measure, that standard. Now, if you would just ask that God clothe you with Christ not with the works of the law, not Jewish tradition, not human tradition, not custom, but that we would be clothed with Jesus, that we would conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of God, that we would walk in a manner worthy of God, clothed in Jesus day in and day out. Lord God, quicken our minds to understand what it means that we are no longer people of flesh, but people of the spirit. Help us to contemplate and understand what it means that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit, controlled by the Holy Spirit. Help us to remember what it means, Lord, and to understand what it means that if we walk by the Spirit, we will not carry out the desires of the flesh. God, cause us to know what it is to be clothed with Christ, set free from sin, set free from death, set free from the, the authority of the law to walk in newness of life liberated to live in power by your good grace and that we would no longer give any provision, any opportunity, any life to the deeds of the flesh. But God, that we would walk in a manner worthy of God. That we would walk as wise, that we would walk according to the promises and the truth of your scripture, your power, your son. God, as we go out from this place, I pray that we would think on you this week, that we'd love you well. God, that our lives would be measured by you, by who you are, your truth, your grace, your kindness, your love. That that would be made evident in the way we treat others. God, that we would think of ourselves in the way you think of us, that we would think of others in the way you think of them. And I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in allowing us to come back together, whether it's in small group this week or lunch sometime or next Sunday night in this place, that we would be able to come back together again in fellowship, giving glory to your name. We love you, Lord God. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray these things. Amen.